Majd látom a Facebook-ot. Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Street Church. We are so glad you could join us online this morning. We are so thankful for all that God has blessed us with. That, uh, we just want to give glory to Him right now before we get started with this morning's sermon with the word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your many blessings in our lives, Father. And although uh, many of us are quarantined at home, many of us are working from home, and, and several of us are also not able to work, Father. We ask that you would cover everyone, Father, that your hope and your love would be extended for all to see through us, Father. And that's what our message about the, is this morning, Father, that the people would live out the mission that Jesus set for us for your church. Father, let us hear your word this morning. Let us, our hearts be touched by it. Let us be moved by it. And not just moved emotionally, but moved into action. Let this be our call to the people to not just worship you, but to show and share you with others. We thank you and we praise you in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Well, this morning we are uh, winding down. We're on the, the downside of this sermon series. Uh, next week, Mark will finish this up. But this week we're on the mission, the mission of the church. And the, the question that I have to ask is, we get started this morning, is what is the best use of our time? And when you think about that, do you ever remember your parents uh, asking you if what you were doing was the best use of your time. Now that may have sounded pretty weird when you were a kid because you were probably playing or doing something, but maybe there was a chore that needed to be done that was asked you to, of you to do earlier in the day or maybe even in the days prior to it. And you hadn't gotten to it yet because you had more important things to do, whether that was playing with your Hot Wheels, playing with your G.I. Joe or your Barbie, playing in, in this day and age, you'd be playing with your video games, whether it's on your uh, console or on your phone. But what is the best use of our time? So here's a, here's a question for you. If you only had 20 minutes to live, what would you do? What would be your action? What would you do or what would you say? Would it be a, a phone call? Uh, would you text somebody? Would you, would you put together an email? Would you try to video chat? Would you freak out? Or would you just sit down in a chair and ball your eyes out? Well, that happened to Cynthia Manley a few years ago. She found out she had 20 minutes to live. And so she sat down and she sent a text to her daughters, to her daughter Alana, who was a student at Seattle University. She texted, stay strong and no matter what happens, take care of you and sis. Find a way to get to California and be together soon and be a family. I love you so much. And then to her other daughter, Alyssa, she wrote, no matter what happens, get your degree. Have a good life and be successful and take care of your sister. If that was you, what would you have said? What you, would you have done? But here's the thing. It turns out that Cynthia had more than 20 minutes. Some of you may remember back to January of 2018 when Hawaii got an alert on everybody's phones telling them of an imminent attack. And that pretty much everyone was going to die. And that was Cynthia's response. The thing is, is that Cynthia and most of those people that were there on that day, they're doing just fine. They're still alive. What happened was, is the state worker chose the wrong menu for the state alert system. And he sent out an alert to the entire island that simply said, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. 
this is not a drill. Now you understand why Cynthia and everybody panicked. In fact, you may have seen pictures on the news or in the papers of parents taking their kids and lowering them down into manholes, trying to shelter them, trying to keep them safe. I think everybody ended up with a happy ending that day, except for the poor guy that sent out the alert. But here's the thing. Was that alert, even though it was false, and actually a gift to the people? Did it cause them to think about life and think about the matters of life and the things that they're doing and the things that they have? Did it make them stop and truly think? I know this virus that we're dealing with right now has stopped me. It has stopped my wife and my friends and my family. It has caused us to stop and think. But in reality, if that were to happen, if that was the truth, what, I can't ask what would you do, but I can certainly ask what would I do? Now I'd like to think that I would find the, crowd, the most crowded place I could find, get up on a on the proverbial soapbox and preach a sermon like Peter did it on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And that people, through that message, would come to Christ like they did on that day. We'll call that the I'd like to think version. Only God knows if that actually happened, what I would do. There's always that I'd like to think version of what we imagine ourselves doing. But either way, it puts what's important into perspective. The question that comes to mind is, shouldn't we live that way every day? That alert is not altogether unlike the alert that should guide our lives. What if the message was, quick, Jesus is coming. What would you do? Would you have already been prepared like the five bridesmaids or would you have run out of, of oil for your lamp and have to run to the, the merchant to buy more and then not be there when he got there? What do you choose to do? And whether it's 20 minutes or 20 years, one day you and I will stand before God we will have to give an account for our lives. Here's the thing. Jesus might return in a few minutes, a few weeks, a few years, even a few centuries. We don't know. But we should always be ready. One could argue that we are in the last days, and we're not going to have that argument today. We're not going to even talk about that. Well, I can tell you that regardless of that, we are in our last days because our lives are finite. At some point, our lives will end. Will you be ready? If you are in Jesus, the conversation on the day that you meet is already loosely scripted for us. Go to Matthew 25, verse 23. Jesus said it will go something like this. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And then in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. It is only by faith in Jesus that we will go to heaven. But there are three things that we can do here and now that will carry beyond our earthly days. We have to become one in Christ. The glory you bring to the name of Christ will carry beyond. And the impact that you have on other people will carry beyond. 
As the old saying goes, you can't take it with you. We can't take our possessions. We can't take our money. We can't take our cars. We can't take any of that with us. What we can take with us is what we did here in Jesus' name for others. Where you decide to spend eternity is on you. You have to choose that. But I pray, Pastor Mark prays, Pastor Josh prays, we pray that you will take Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then you and I, and Mark, and Josh, and our wives, and our families, and, and all the other Christians, will be able to spend eternity in heaven together. But let's go back to the here and now. Let's come right back to where we are now and, and understand that we can't stay complacent. You see, God's glory endures forever. So everything that we do for God's glory just adds to his glory. Think about it this way. You, you're at work. Whether you like your job or not, you're at work, right? Everything you do at your job, do you do it for who or what? When I'm at work, when I'm working, which I, right now I am blessed to still be working, I do it for God. I do it to bring Him glory. And that's what we're going to talk about. Because we need to touch lives. So for the rest of our time today, we're going to focus on the impact that you and I have on others. So if you have your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to take a look at verses 10 and 11. It says, For we must st all stand before Christ to be judged. We will receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. And I hope you know that I am human, and I just gave you the wrong book. You want to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. So, I need to be clear here. We cannot do anything to earn our way into heaven. It doesn't work that way. But what we do brings glory to God in heaven. Everyone who believes in Jesus goes to heaven, and everyone who goes to heaven will be rewarded according to what they have done with other people. So, what are we supposed to do with other people? Paul showed us the first thing in 2 Corinthians 5.11. He said, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. Now that is huge. Every person we lead to Jesus will spend eternity with Jesus. But also understand that you may just be planting a seed. We don't actually do the leading. That's of the Holy Spirit. We plant the seed. We may water it. But God brings that harvest. So is there really any better use of our time and our lives than to help others know him? There is no formula for persuading anyone to believe. Trust me. Before I had a clue, I tried, and that doesn't work. You get into a tense conversation, you both look at each other like you're going to get mad, and then you change the subject. It doesn't work. There are other ways. So, one could use an ex the example of the four spiritual laws that Bill Bright wrote. But, again, that's not showing God's love. It's not showing the hope that we have. Those four spiritual laws, they quickly explain why we need a Savior and how to find salvation. But if people don't see why, if they don't see why you have a hope, if they don't see why you love God, then it, those don't matter. It's just like reading more pages. 
So there's not a one size fits all. Think about it. When you talk to people, you can't talk to this person the same way you talk to this person. You can't treat this person the same way you treat this person. They have different personalities. And the way that you interact with them is different. And so we, we have to look at what is, uh, what can we do? So also understand that some people are ready to hear the good news. And some flat out aren't. What we can do is we can give you five easy to remember words to help you in that process. Now, Craig Groeschel, he uses these words for his volunteers, but they are five great words to reach out to anyone. And here they are. I notice. And you matter. Five words. I notice. And you matter. Now, you may not have the right answer to every question as you have a conversation with someone. But what you need to do is you need to pray about that conversation. You need to care on that over that person or those people, and then sh you will earn the right to share that. But, Pastor, my testimony is that I grew up in the church. I don't have any fabulous story to tell about how I converted to Christianity, how I became a lover of Jesus Christ. So what? I grew up in the church. I don't have this fantabulous story about how I was down at the bottom, how I was on drugs and all these other I don't have that story. That's not my story. My story, God is using for specific people. Pastor Mark's story, he uses for other people. Pastor Josh's story, our wives, he uses each of us in different ways with our stories. But you can notice people and you can let them know that they matter. That they matter to you and to God. And you guess what? When you tell somebody that they matter, they respond. Now, what you do or may not do or what you say or may not say may guide them in their path to Jesus. But that seed is planted. Once the seed's planted, it's planted. It's a place where we can start with everyone. And see, it's the little things. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25? He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's celebrate. But if we go down a few more verses, if we go down to verses 37 through 40, listen to what he says, he explains a little bit more. He says, then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did I ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison or and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Yesterday, my wife and I, we went over and we mowed my mother-in-law's yard probably for the last time because it should be sold here in about two weeks. And we're really thankful for that. I know mom's thankful for that. But we've got to talk to the neighbor again. And David has been a wonderful neighbor. And he said, oh, I didn't do that much. I said, Dave, you helped me out this winter when I couldn't breathe because of, of a chest ailment. You blew the snow so I didn't have to come over and shovel. Oh, that's nothing. I said, Dave, remember what Jesus said. I tell you the truth. When, I do, when you do this to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. I reminded him that it's as simple as giving someone a glass of water. Why? Because it counts. I love it. It's like Jesus is saying, just go beyond yourself in any way and I will take it. 
that you have beyond yourself, and I will take it. So you open the, the door for the guy in the wheelchair. It counts. You smiled at the grumpy lady across the street that has the dog that yips all the time. It counts. You complimented your wife. It counts. Every tiny compliment can have an internal impact. I call this next level kindness. See, a little compliment can go a long way. It can be a big deal. You don't know what that person's going through, and that compliment could be raising them up. Now, the one question I would have you ask yourself as you're doing that is, are you doing it for them? Are you doing it for you? Are you doing it for God? I would hope that you're doing it for God through them and for them through God. Let's not be selfish. Let's not be doing things for ourselves. Because, you know what? We're all pretty self-focused. We can all be a little selfish. And I would even go so far as to say that we all have different levels of selfishness. And this is an area where we can all grow. And so let's, let's start the beginning level and call it the kindergarten of kindness. This is the level when you don't shove someone out of the way during a fire alarm. And you don't think you're the smartest person or the strongest person in the room. Now, I would hope that most of us have graduated from the kindergarten of kindness and gone on to the elementary school of selflessness. And I think that's where we may get stuck as Christians. See... This is where you can let other people go before you without shoving them out of the way. You can share with others. And when people are with you, you try to put them first. But like any grade school kid, when they're out of sight, they're probably out of mind. And I could say that, you know, at some level I've been stuck there before. And I'm ready to move past it. I don't want to just go past the elementary school of selfishness. I want to get past the high school level of selfishness. Now think of that as uh, when people are not with you, you actually do pray for them. And you do think about them when they're not around. And you try to figure out how you can be a blessing to them. But what if we were to graduate the collegiate level of self self selflessness and kindness? And this is not where you not only think about other people when they are not with you, but you also sacrifice your own well-being, your own comfort, and your own stuff to help them out. These are the people who turn their families into orphanages because they just can't quite let kids grow up without families. These are the people who move to Malaysia or Pakistan or India to bring people into the kingdom. And of course, you think of this, Jesus, he's the ultimate example of this level of selflessness and kindness, because he gave his life for us. He sacrificed himself even when we were still enemies of God. So if reaching out to others begins with, I notice and you matter, then what is the next step? How do we get beyond that kindergarten level of kindness and the others and go beyond that? Again, there's no formula, but there is a method. The problem is, for some of you, is this method might be a little hard. It might be even dangerous. So let's put a warning label on it and prepare yourselves. See, if you really want to do what we're talking about today. Your life is going to be forever changed. So, this simple method, this life-changing method, is dangerous, but it will change your life forever. Now, think about this. How should you start? The same way we do everything. We start in prayer. And 
if we radically want to change what happens on the day when we have to give account, we need to follow these steps. And this is not a one-time prayer. This is not something you just say and move on. This is not that prayer that you pray before the meal that's the same thing you pray two or three times a day or the same prayer that you pray every night before you go to bed. This is a life-changing prayer. You are going to pray this prayer as part of your daily prayer life. You are going to make this a part of your every day. You are going to pray it every time you see someone in pain. You're going to pray it every time God puts someone in your mind. And you will pray it every time you notice someone and want to make sure that they know that they matter. If you honestly pray this prayer every day about someone, your life will change. I promise you that. So are you ready for that? Are you ready to graduate? Here it is. It's also five words. Lord, what do they need? And there's a second part. What should I do? What do they need? What should I do? And you're asking God to tell you not only what they need, but what you should do. And you need to do it. Can you see how that can change everything? Let me show you how it can work. Let's say you have a friend who, who lost a loved one a month ago. What do you normally do? Well, if you're like the rest of us, you probably say, I'm sorry. We're praying for you and your family. We might even say, how can I help? And what do they normally say to you? Just pray for us. It's hard. Just pray for us. So you promise that you will, then you forget, and not much actually happens until you see them the next time. And as they're walking to you, you say a quick prayer, and you go, hey, 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 how you doing? I prayed for you. That's not what we're talking about. Imagine it more like this. Same person has lost someone in their life. You say, Lord, what do they need? Then a thought comes to your mind that says, they need to know they're not alone. Then you pray, what should I do? And not long after your prayer, you have an idea to take them to lunch. And then you call them up. And you don't ask the impossible to answer question, how can I help? Because you're asking them for the answer. Ask them this question. Can I take you out to lunch? Can I take you out to dinner? Can we go have coffee? And just like that, you have moved into the atmosphere of serving that person. This prayer is small, yet very big. Think of how our lives, our church, our community, our state, our nation, and the world would change if we would all make this a regular discipline in our lives, that we would pray this prayer every day for someone else. This prayer should be as much a part of your day as brushing your teeth or spending time in the Bible. Now, we may not be able to do this for everyone, and this goes back to what Mark and I have talked about many times before. We are the hands and feet of Christ. Each of us is a different part. And together, this is why we gather, together we can reach so many more people. Imagine the impact we'll have then. And it works on so many levels. It can work for mean people who are working at the government office while you're standing in line. And I happen to think of somebody close to us as I was doing that. And then, what if you say, God, what do they need? And, and you hear him say, I think they need a little compassion. And you say, what should I do? And he says, tell them that you appreciate them and how hard they work and for what they have to deal with on a day in and day out basis. Because the prayer, it can work instantly through that. You can see a homeless guy and right there pray, God, what does he need? And dignity comes to mind. It may not be anything material. Maybe it's just dignity. God, what do you want me to do? 
And God may simply want you to walk over to him. Ask him how you can pray for him. It counts. You might pray every day, God, my daughter is struggling. What does she need? And one day it comes to you and says, she needs to know that you're there for her no matter what. Then you pray, God, how do you want me to do this? And and you come up with a way and you say, you find a way to reach out toward her every day. Not just once in a while, every day. And you keep praying. See, it counts. This prayer is not only effective It goes back to what I said earlier. It's dangerous. Listen to what James says in chapter 4, verse 17. He says, Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. The danger is that you have to follow through with these prayers because we know what we ought to do. It's dangerous not to do it. Here's an example. God, what does that couple you brought into my mind need this morning? Well, Terry, they need a car for their daughter. Okay. Well, um, God, how do you want me to do that? Give them one. Fear can come across your face, right? But people are out there doing this each and every day. There was a guy that followed the line at the unemployment office this past week. What did he do? Now, I don't know if he spoke to God about it. I don't know if he prayed this prayer about it. But what he did something. He, he got into action. He went to the, do- to the bank. He withdrew $10,000 out of his account. And he went and gave every single person in line $100 to go buy groceries for their family. If God asks us to do something, if God asks us to get somebody a car, he may not be asking you to pay for it yourself. He's asking you to find a way to get that car for their daughter. And all of a sudden, boom, we have graduated from the college of selflessness and kindness. So here's my question to you. Are you willing to join us on that journey? Are you willing to get dangerous with your prayer life? Would you start by finding one person every day? And it may be the same person day after day until God gives you what you need to do. And ask them, God, what should I do? And how should I do it? And also go up to that person and let them know that you notice them and that they matter. God may not immediately answer every prayer, and you may not ever end up buying someone a car. But I do know that sooner or later, God will bring some ideas to your mind. And on that last day, you will be glad you did, because until that day, your life is full of ministry stories. We want to challenge you all. We want to challenge you to try this every day this week and see what happens. If you do this daily, then I believe that all of us, when we are finally able to come back together, will have story after story after story to share. We may even have to spend an entire service just sharing stories. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be amazing? We'll have stories about changing people's lives and how God used us, how he included us. We may even have stories about how he scared us and yet came through for us. What an adventurous life we are about to live. Please, don't let this be another nice sermon. We want this to be a call to action. We want this to be a call for you to help us here at Grace Street Church reimagine what church is. There's a mission. There's things that God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to to hear something and say, oh, that was good, and then go on about our lives. 
He wants us to take the words that we hear, to meditate on those words, to let them fill our hearts, and then to go out and use that. We need to be the hands and feet of God. We need to show the world the love that he has given us and the hope that he has provided to us. If you do this, if you join us in making this part of your day, then this is just the beginning for all of us at Grace Street Church to have an eternal impact on the kingdom. Pray with me now. Father, thank you for the love and kindness you have and continue to show us. Thank you for our salvation. It is our prayer that you would help us notice others, not just ourselves. And that you would help us to let them know that they matter not only to us, but that they matter to you. Remind us to seek your will in all that we do and say for and to others. Please show us how we can make a difference in people's lives and that through you we would touch at least one person's life every day. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. And please join me in saying, Amen. So as we come into our time of communion today, I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 23 through 25. As we think about the most selfless act that has ever been committed, and that was by Christ when he gave himself up for us. So on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and he broke the bread, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. And later on in the meal, he took a cup, and when he had filled it, he blessed the cup, and he said, This is the blood of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you take of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. He took on the sins of the world. He took on all the injustice, all the inequities of the world in a selfless act of kindness. See, in that selfless act of kindness, he gave us the grace and the mercy to get through each and every day. He gave us the forgiveness of sins in a selfless act. He gave himself as a sacrifice for us. He took on our sins selflessly as a sacrifice so that we could come and join him in the presence of Almighty God. And as Terry was talking about in, in the message today, we talk about what our mission is. Our mission is to serve God while we are here on earth, and we do that by serving others. So in this act of communion today, I ask that you would join with me as I take of the bread and of the cup. And let's do it in remembrance of that selfless act of kindness, of grace, and mercy. The body and the blood of Christ. Join with me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we just come before you today and we ask that you would help us to become your hands and feet. As we've said many times, life ends eternity where? And in Terry's message today, you gave us those answers. You gave us the way to go, to get to that place through selfless acts of kindness and to serve others.
So Lord, as we come into our houses and, and as we go out into the world today, we just pray that you would be with us, that you're, you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, and that your Spirit would guide and direct us to help serve others, to fulfill the mission that you put on our hearts, that we were created to do and be the people we are created to be. In Jesus' name.